Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum. Today, inshallah, we will discuss another topic of abdomen that is rectus sheath. First of all, the definition of rectus sheath. This is an aponeurotic sheath covering the rectus abdominis muscle. That's why it is named as rectus sheath because it is covering the rectus abdominis muscle. It has two walls. One is anterior wall and one is posterior wall. The difference between anterior and posterior wall is very important. The anterior wall is complete. The posterior wall is incomplete being deficient above the costal margin and the arcuate line. The composition of anterior wall is variable. The posterior wall composition is uniform. The anterior wall is firmly adherent to the tendinous intersections of the rectus abdominis muscle. The posterior wall is free from the rectus abdominis muscle. See here, this is anterior wall. It is complete. That is from the costal margin till the pubic symphysis. There is the anterior wall of the rectus abdominis present or rectus sheath present. Its composition is variable. That is in the upper part, it is formed by different aponeurosis. In the middle part, it is formed by different aponeurosis. And in the lower part, it is formed by different aponeurosis. It is firmly adherent to the three intersections. One intersection is present at the level of xephoid process. One is present at the level of umbilicus. And one is present between the two. The anterior wall of the rectus sheath is firmly adherent to these tendinous intersections. The posterior wall is incomplete, being deficient above the costal margin and below the arcuate line. Its composition will be uniform and it is not adherent to the tendinous intersections of the rectus abdominis muscle. Now see here in this diagram, this is linea alba and this is the linea semilunaris. The linea alba is present in the midline. Fusion of all aponeurosis occur in the midline. See here, all the aponeurosis which are forming the anterior and the posterior wall, they will be fused in the midline and they will form the linea alba. Laterally, the anterior and the posterior walls, they extend till the linea semilunaris. That is, this is the extent of the rectus abdominis muscle. It will end at the line of the or at the linea semilunaris. This linea semilunaris will extend from 9th costal cartilage to the pubic tubercle. Here there is the pubic tubercle. This is half moon shaped line which will be extending from the 9th costal cartilage to the pubic tubercle. Now the rectus sheath is divided into three parts. Number one is above the costal margin. Number two is below the costal margin and arcuate line or between the costal margin and arcuate line. Number three is below the arcuate line. See here, this is the first level above the costal margin. This is the second level that is below the costal margin or you can say between the costal margin and the arcuate line. This is arcuate line. This is the second division. And third, it is below the arcuate line. This is the arcuate line and below the arcuate line is the third part of the rectus sheath. In these three parts of rectus sheath, the rectus sheath is formed differently. First of all, we will discuss the first part that is the above the costal margin. Here we can see that this is the rectus abdominis muscle. This is the anterior wall of the rectus sheath and this is the posterior part of the rectus sheath. The anterior wall is formed by the aponeurosis of the external oblique muscle only. The posterior wall of the rectus sheath is deficient here. Here there is the fifth coastal cartilage and the sixth coastal cartilage and the seventh coastal cartilage. As we have discussed before that the posterior wall is deficient in two parts. Number one is above the coastal margin and number two is below the arcuate line. So here you can see that the posterior wall is deficient. Here there are three coastal cartilages which are present that is the 
fifth one and the sixth one and the seventh one and anteriorly only one aponeurosis is present that is the external oblique muscle aponeurosis so this is the first part now we will come toward the second part this is between the coastal margin and the arcuate line here the three aponeurosis see here these are three muscles the external oblique muscle the internal oblique muscle and the transversus abdominis muscle so the external oblique muscle will be transformed into the aponeurosis this aponeurosis will pass anteriorly of the rectus abdominis muscle the internal oblique muscle will be divided into two lamina the anterior lamina will pass anteriorly beneath the external oblique aponeurosis and the posterior lamina will pass posteriorly above the fascia transversalis so this is the fascia transversalis which is present or it is the aponeurosis of the transversus abdominis muscle this is the aponeurosis of the transversus abdominis muscle so in this area the anterior wall is formed by one and a half lamina and the posterior wall is formed by one and a half lamina the first lamina is of the external oblique aponeurosis and the half of the lamina of the internal oblique aponeurosis then posteriorly half of the lamina of the internal oblique or you can say if the internal oblique is divided into two lamina then one lamina will go anteriorly and one lamina will go posteriorly or you can say half this is one and a half and this is one and a half that is the half lamina of the internal oblique aponeurosis and full of the aponeurosis of the transversus abdominis muscle so they are enclosing the rectus abdominis muscle or forming the anterior and the posterior walls of the rectus sheath then the third part see here this is the third area which is the arcuate line here all three aponeuroses that is of the external oblique and internal oblique and transversus abdominis muscle they will pass anteriorly or they will form anterior wall of the rectus sheath only the fascia transversalis is present posteriorly here the posterior wall is also deficient here only the fascia transversalis is present below the rectus or behind the rectus abdominis muscle now again i will describe above the coastal margin there are the structures which are forming the rectus sheath see here this is rectus abdominis muscle there is one only one external oblique aponeurosis or only one aponeurosis which is forming the anterior ball behind the fifth and sixth and seventh coastal cartilages are present so the posterior wall is deficient so it is written also anterior wall it is formed by the aponeurosis of only one muscle that is external oblique muscle the posterior wall is deficient the rectus muscle rests on fifth and sixth and seventh coastal cartilages number two level in this diagram also you can see the first level that is in the region above the coastal margin again you can see this is external oblique muscle and this is external oblique aponeurosis and these are three coastal cartilages which are forming the posterior part or the posterior wall is deficient here now between the coastal margin and the level of the anterior superior iliac spine the arcuate line is present at the level of anterior superior iliac spine or you can say it is the level which is above the arcuate line here the aponeurosis of the internal oblique will divide into two lamella see here these are two lamella this is the anterior wall and this is the posterior wall the anterior wall is formed by the external oblique aponeurosis and the anterior lamellae of the internal oblique aponeurosis the posterior wall is formed by the posterior lamellae of the internal oblique aponeurosis and the transversus abdominis aponeurosis so this is the anterior wall of the rectus sheath and this is the posterior wall of the rectus sheath in this region it is between the coastal margin to midway between the umbilicus and the pubic symphysis that is the level of arcuate line is either the anterior superior iliac spine level or the arcuate line is in between the umbilicus and the pubic symphysis see here from this diagram 
this is the anterior superior iliac spine level and this is the level of the arcuate line or you can say this arcuate line is present between the umbilicus and the pubic symphysis so it is in between so this is the extent of the second part the second part will be extended from the coastal margin to the arcuate line so you can say that it is below the coastal margin or above the arcuate line or at the level of the anterior superior iliac spine or it is between the coastal margin and the point which is midway between the umbilicus and the pubic symphysis see here this is the arcuate line which is present here this arcuate line is at the same level of the anterior superior iliac spine number one number two this arcuate line is present midway between the umbilicus and the pubic symphysis at this arcuate line there is one artery which is present which is named as inferior epigastric artery midway between the umbilicus and the pubic symphysis the posterior wall of the rectus sheath ends in an arcuate line this arcuate line is also called as linea semicircularis or fold of doubtless it is concave downward see here it is concave downward this line is also named as linea semicircularis or fold of doubtless now the third level that is between the level of anterior superior iliac spine and the pubis or you can say below the arcuate line the anterior wall is formed by all three aponeuroses there will be all three aponeuroses which are forming the anterior wall all three flat muscles they will form the um, uh, the anterior wall the aponeurosis of the transversus abdominis muscle and the internal oblique muscle they are fused and the external oblique muscle will remain separate this is a diagram which is showing the first division in this diagram you can see the third level this is the third division or third part of the abdomen in which there is the below the arcuate line all three aponeuroses will pass anteriorly or form the anterior wall the posterior wall is deficient here only the transversalis fascia is present so posterior wall is deficient the rectus muscle lies only on the fascia transversalis at the level of the anterior superior iliac spine the posterior wall forms the arcuate line at this side the inferior epigastric artery enter the rectus sheath and pass upward to anastomos with the superior epigastric artery you can see here the inferior epigastric artery is entering the rectus sheath at this arcuate line and this inferior epigastric artery it will anastomos with the superior epigastric artery so this is the three parts number one number two or number three or these are the three divisions number first division then second and then third it is above the coastal margin it is below the arcuate line and this is an area which is between the coastal margin and the arcuate line in this diagram also you can see that this is the first part in which above the coastal margin the anterior wall is formed only by the external oblique aponeurosis and posteriorly it is deficient and here only the fifth and sixth and seventh cartilages are present then above the arcuate line is the second part here the external oblique aponeurosis and anterior lamellae of the internal oblique aponeurosis will pass anteriorly and the internal oblique aponeurosis posterior lamellae and the aponeurosis of the transversus abdominis muscle will pass posteriorly then in the third level that is below the arcuate line the all aponeurosis they will pass anteriorly and only the fascia transversalis is present posteriorly so the posterior wall is deficient in this part and in this part that is above the coastal margin and below the arcuate line now what are the contents of the rectus sheath see here this is the area of the rectus sheath here the rectus abdominis muscle is present here one pyramidalis muscle is also present which may or may not be present blood vessels there is the superior epigastric artery and inferior epigastric artery which are anastomosing with one another veins the superior epigastric vein which will drain into the internal thoracic vein and the inferior epigastric vein which will join the external iliac 
thick vein and the nerves there are the lower five intercostal nerves and the subcostal nerves see here t7 t8 t9 t10 and t11 these are lower five intercostal nerves and the subcostal nerve is t12 so these are the structures which are present in the rectus sheath first of all muscles then blood vessels in blood vessels there are arteries and veins and then the nerves which are present what is the function of rectus sheath? It checks the bow of rectus muscle during its contraction and increases the efficiency of the muscle. It maintains the strength of anterior abdominal wall. Now this was the old concept of the rectus sheath. Now we will discuss the new concept of the rectus sheath. The rectus sheath is formed by the decussitic fibers from the three abdominal muscles on each side. Each forms a bilaminar aponeurosis at their medial border. Fibers from all three anterior leaves will run obliquely upwards while the posterior fibers run obliquely downwards at right angle to the anterior leaves. So what will happen? The anterior sheath of the rectus abdominis muscle will be formed by both the leaves of external oblique aponeurosis and anterior leaf of the internal oblique aponeurosis and the posterior sheath is formed by the posterior leaf of the aponeurosis of the internal oblique muscle and both leaves of the aponeurosis of the transversus abdominis muscle. See here in this diagram See, this was the old concept. In this old concept, only the internal oblique muscle has divided into two leaves. But in the new concept, what will happen? Each muscle, that is the external oblique muscle and the internal oblique muscle and the transversus abdominis muscle, all these three muscles will divide into two leaves. One will be anterior and one will be posterior. So in the new concept, what will happen? The external oblique two leaves an internal oblique anterior leaf that is the three leaves they will pass anteriorly and the internal oblique posterior leaf and the two leaves of the transversus abdominis muscle they will pass posteriorly so there are three lamella or the three lamina or the three leaves which are present anteriorly and three lamina which are present posteriorly so total there are six lamina two of external oblique two of internal oblique and two of transversus abdominis muscle and these lamella they are divided from the aponeurosis or the aponeurosis is forming these lamella three will pass anteriorly and three will pass posteriorly so total six lamellae but in the old concept only three lamellae one and a half anterior and one and a half posterior in old concept the external oblique will not divide into two lamina and the aponeurosis of the transversus abdominis muscle will also not divide into two lamina only the internal oblique aponeurosis will divide into two lamina one is anterior and one is posterior but in the new concept all these three muscle aponeurosis will divide into two lamina two of external oblique two of internal oblique and two of transversus abdominis three will pass anteriorly and three will pass posteriorly fibers of each layer decussate to the opposite side of the sheath then fibers also decussate between anterior and posterior sheath that is fiber of each layer the external oblique aponeurosis of one side will decussate with the external oblique aponeurosis of the other side then if there are two lamellae of the external oblique then the anterior lamella will decussate with the posterior lamellae of the external oblique aponeurosis and anterior lamellae of the left side will decussate with the posterior lamellae of the right side of the external oblique aponeurosis the three lateral abdominal muscles may be may said to be digastric with the central tendon in the form of the linea alba. The linea alba is a tendinous raft between the xephoid process and the pubic symphysis. Above the umbilicus, the linea alba is broader. Now there can be rectus sheath hematoma. See here, this is one hematoma or the blood collection in the rectus sheath it occurs on the right side below the umbilicus see here it can occur on the left side but most commonly it can occur on the right side below the umbilicus and can cause the abdominal pain the source of bleeding is the inferior epigastric artery or vein it occurs during a severe cuff or blunt trauma
there can be divarication of recti there are two rectus abdominis muscle and this is the linea alba which is present this is the normal abdomen but sometimes what happen these rectus abdominis muscles they will be separate out or they will form one space in between or at the region of the linea alba they are spreading out they will go in the lateral direction so there is one space which is created this is named as divarication or it is also named as diastasis of rectus abdominis muscle in multi para and chronically weak children the upper part of the linea alba becomes stretched out and weak so the fingers can be insinuated between these two recti this condition is named as divarication of recti the extra peritoneal fat may also protrude out see here this is the extra peritoneal fat and the peritoneum and a small part of the bowel also can protrude out between the interlacing fibers of the linea alba sometimes the peritoneal tube or the greater omentum can also herniate this is named as epigastric hernia or the hernia through the linea alba this is the linea alba and this is the epigastric hernia which is in the epigastric region or in the linea alba again i have pasted here some diagrams from which you can learn that how the rectus sheath is formed umbilical ring now i will describe what is umbilical ring in thin muscular people there is a groove which is visible in the skin overlying the linea alba at its middle underlying the umbilicus the linea alba contains the umbilical ring this is one defect in the linea alba through which the fetal umbilical vessels pass to and from the umbilical cord and the placenta two umbilical arteries and one umbilical vein all layers of the anterior lateral abdominal wall they fuse at the umbilical as the fat accumulates in the subcutaneous tissue postnatally the skin become raised around the umbilical ring and the umbilicus become depressed this occurs 7 to 14 days after birth when the atrophic umbilical cord falls off see here in this diagram this is the umbilicus below this umbilicus there is the umbilical ring at the umbilicus this is the meeting point of three systems number 1 is the vascular system see here this is one part of the vascular system this is umbilical vein and these are two umbilical arteries they are meeting or they are attached to the umbilicus they are present in the umbilical cord two umbilical arteries and one umbilical vein they are present in the umbilical cord then there is another system which is connected at the umbilicus which is the urinary system the bladder is connected to the umbilicus by one tube or one duct that is named as urecus urecus is a structure or a tube which is connecting the urinary bladder to the umbilicus and the third system is the digestive system see here this is a part of midgut that is the ileum this digestive system or digestive tract is connected to the umbilicus through one duct that is named as white line duct or omphalomesenteric duct this is very important point that at umbilicus there are three systems which are meeting to one another then what will happen when the baby is born this umbilical cord will be shed off and this umbilical cord there was a umbilical vein and there were two umbilical arteries these two umbilical arteries now they are present as the medial umbilical ligaments medial umbilical ligaments are the remnant of two umbilical arteries there are two medial umbilical ligaments on each side of the umbilicus and this is the ligamentum teres or the round ligament of the liver which is present on the inferior surface of the liver this is a remnant of the umbilical vein so two umbilical arteries are present as the medial umbilical ligament and the umbilical vein is the uh, is dis has been disappeared and now the round ligament of the liver is present then this ileum was connected to the umbilicus through this white line duct this white line duct is not present in the newborn baby and if it is present then this will be patent white line duct or the meckel's diverticulum can be formed here then this urecus normally this urecus will be disappeared but if this urecus is present then there will be urinary fistula normally the urecus will disappear and there is one ligament that is named as median 
umbilical ligament this is a single ligament which is in the middle or median part it is the structure which is the remnant of urecus which was connecting the urinary bladder to the umbilicus now the median umbilical ligament is present two medial umbilical ligaments are present which are the remnants of the umbilical arteries then there is the ligamentum teres which is present or which is also called as round ligament of the liver it is a remnant of umbilical vein and there can be the vital line duct has been disappeared and there can be one pathology that is named as meckel's diverticulum if this vital line duct persists see here this is umbilical ring this is the umbilical cord umbilical ring and umbilical cord in umbilical cord there are there is one umbilical vein and there are two umbilical arteries this umbilical vein will form the ligamentum teres or the round ligament of the liver and these two umbilical arteries they are present in, in as the medial umbilical fold or medial umbilical ligaments this is urinary bladder and this is the urecus which is present here this urecus will disappear appear and will form the median umbilical fold then this is the mid gut or the part of the ileum which is present it will disappear if it persists it form the meckel's diverticulum so this is the meeting point of three systems one is urinary system one is vascular system and one is digestive system now what is fascia transversalis the inner surface of the abdominal muscles is lined by one fascia which is separated from the peritoneum by the extra peritoneal connective tissue that part of fascia which lines the inner surface of the transversus abdominis muscle is called as fascia transversalis the extent of fascia transversalis anteriorly it is adherent to the linea alba above the umbilicus posteriorly it merges with the thoracolumbar fascia and it is continuous with the renal fascia superiorly it is continuous with the diaphragmatic fascia inferiorly it is continuous with the fascia iliaca medially it is attached to the pubic tubercle pubic crest and the pectineal line part of it is prolonged into the thigh as the anterior wall of the femoral sheath see here anteriorly it will be adherent to the linea alba posteriorly it will form the thoracolumbar fascia superiorly it will form the diaphragmatic fascia inferiorly it is the same fascia but it will be named as the fascia iliaca medially it will be attached to the pubic tubercle and in the thigh it will form the femoral sheath now the opening of the deep inguinal ring in the fascia transversalis there is one opening that is named as deep inguinal ring this deep inguinal ring is about 1.2 cm above the mid inguinal point see here this is the mid inguinal point what is the mid inguinal point mid inguinal point is a point which is in between the anterior superior iliac spine and the pubic symphysis the mid point of the inguinal ligament is a point which is between the anterior superior iliac spine and the pubic tubercle so this deep inguinal ring is above the mid inguinal point and how much above about 1.2 cm above and this is an oval shaped opening because the superficial inguinal ring is triangular opening so this is oval shaped opening which is present in the fascia transversalis this ring is immediately lateral to the inferior epigastric artery see here this is inferior epigastric artery and this deep inguinal ring is lateral to the inferior epigastric artery it will transmit the spermatic cord in male and the round ligament of uterus in females see here this is the deep inguinal ring it is formed in the fascia transversalis and here this is the superficial inguinal ring which is formed in the aponeurosis of the external oblique muscle this is the spermatic cord which is coming through this inguinal canal and passing through the deep inguinal ring and the superficial inguinal ring this is inferior epigastric artery which is medial to this deep inguinal ring that is the deep inguinal ring is lateral to the inferior epigastric artery Prolongations of the fascia transversalis 
the tubular prolongation of the fascia transversal is surrounding the spermatic cord will form the internal spermatic fascia this is very important the spermatic cord has three coverings the external spermatic fascia then there is the cremasteric fascia and then there is the internal spermatic fascia the external spermatic fascia is formed by the aponeurosis of the outer muscle that is external oblique muscle then the cremasteric fascia is formed by the middle muscle that is the internal oblique oblique muscle aponeurosis and the inner one the fascia transversalis or the inner one the internal spermatic fascia it is formed by the third muscle or fascia transversalis that is the transversus abdominis muscle aponeurosis and deep to the transversus abdominis there is the fascia that is named as fascia transversalis in the thigh it will form the anterior wall of the femoral sheath in the femoral sheath along with the lymph nodes there are the femoral vessels which are present the femoral nerve is outside the femoral sheath see here this is the spermatic cord which is passing in the spermatic cord will have three coverings skin and superficial fascia then there will be the external spermatic fascia see here this is the green colored this is the external spermatic fascia this external spermatic fascia is formed by the external oblique aponeurosis then there is the cremasteric fascia this black colored this is the cremasteric fascia it is formed by the internal oblique aponeurosis and then there is the internal spermatic fascia again the green colored this is the internal spermatic fascia it is formed by the fascia transversalis which is deep to the transversus abdominis muscle so these are three coverings which are present here you can see that this is the fascia transversalis which is forming the femoral sheath in the thigh and the femoral vessel is present inside the femoral sheath this is posteriorly it is continuous as the fascia iliaca this is the fascia iliaca because it is present over the iliacus muscle these are three aponeuroses this is external oblique this is internal oblique and this is transversus abdominis muscle the external oblique aponeurosis will form the inguinal ligament it will be folded and thickened and folded over itself and will form the inguinal ligament there is one opening in the external oblique aponeurosis that will be named as the superficial inguinal ring then this is the internal oblique and this is the transversus abdominis and this is the fascia transversalis this fascia transversalis has one opening that is named as deep inguinal ring this external oblique aponeurosis will be continued as external spermatic fascia the internal oblique aponeurosis will be continued as the premasteric fascia and the transversus abdominis aponeurosis will be continued as the internal spermatic fascia or the fascia transversalis will be continued as the internal spermatic fascia now this is the femoral sheath see here this is the femoral canal this is medial side and this one is the lateral side this is the femoral sheath the femoral sheath is covering or it is uh, enclosing the femoral canal in the femoral canal there are the lymph nodes which are present then this is the femoral vein and this is the femoral artery these are the three structures which are enclosed by the femoral sheath and outside the femoral sheath there is the femoral nerve so the main arteries of the anterior abdominal wall and pelvis they lie inside the fascia transversalis while the main nerve is outside that's why the femoral vessels they are inside the femoral sheath because they are inside the fascia transversalis but the femoral nerve is outside the sheath